who don't know me, my name is Veronica. Um, Greta and I started this class um, as kind of a fun way to learn about our anatomy as we are doing yoga. Um, so today we're kind of focused on the ball and socket joints, but I wanted to bring in, um, I talked about these muscles last week when we did kind of a sequence on the heart, but I kind of want to revisit them. Um, because we are working them a lot today, and they're huge muscles that stabilize our shoulder um, and actually keep it from dislocating and also kind of give us all of these, these movements in a, in a very energetic way. So um, the first one I'm going to start with is the pectoralis major. So it originates at the sternum, kind of that thick bone right in the middle of your chest. You can almost tap it. And then it, it attaches to the front of the arm or the head of the humerus. Um, and its actions is to move the arm forward, kind of, I think of it as like kind of giving a hug motion is what the pectoralis major is a big, is kind of used for. We also use it to lift anything, uh, drink coffee out of a mug. Um, and we're gonna practice it tonight. Uh, we're gonna stretch it in supported fish. So we're gonna stretch it by doing the opposite of a hug. We're gonna go open um, and we're gonna kind of engage the muscle and contract it and allow it to relax in a contracted state in the melted heart. So this action involves the pec major of melting heart and uh, we'll try to find the muscle to relax in its position. The next muscle is kind of a tricky one. It's called the subscapularis. So it's actually underneath the shoulder blade. So we have the top of the shoulder blade and this muscle's underneath it. So you can kind of access it through your armpit, but it's kind of hard because you're poking around in there. But it's almost like a mirror version of the pec. It's like its other side um, that's hidden behind the scapula. And it has the same movement as the pec, um, which outside of pulling your arm forward, it doesn't do that. But what it does do is this kind of inward motion, turns everything in, kind of almost like what we do instinctually in winter, is just kind of hug or when we're guarding, is this movement. Um, and we will practice this tonight if cow face arms is the best stretch for it, because it stretches one and it contracts the other. Um, and then also in melting heart, um, we're gonna be using the subscap, but we're gonna be using it and simultaneously relaxing it. Here's another image of kind of how they're juxtaposed. So the big pec major hangs over the ribs as a nice big guard and the subscap is behind it. And then when you kind of think of it, in terms of the heart, you have the subscap back there, the big pec in the front, and the heart there. So they kind of sandwich the heart. So energetically, these two muscles, they have the same action, and they're guarding this wonderful thing uh, that pumps blood into our whole system. Uh, so those are kind of two muscles of both attached to that ball and socket joint, they stabilize our shoulder, we use them to lift, we use them to hug, we use them to drink water. Um, but it also has this kind of energetic, cool thing where it's covering and protecting our heart and these two big muscles that are, um, that we don't wanna get tight because if they get tight, that means our chest gets tight and that means our heart can't maybe pump as it would like to pump. So those are the things we're working today. I'll switch it over to Greta. I will pepper in some things throughout and teach some poses, but you're gonna hear Greta's voice. Hi, cool. I also want to say hi to Darcy and Fabiola. So awesome to have you here. Okay. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and start claps in a comfortable seat. Um, 
I like to sit on a block when I take a seat, helps the pelvic bowl tilt down and just take a moment to feel really anchored and connected to the sensation of the points of contact between your glutes and your legs and the floor. And then also feel the lifting up and the elevation through the spine, relaxing your shoulders down. And we'll start class today with a couple of clearing breaths and a few rounds of ohm. And I chant ohm to connect us through resonance and sound and vibration before we enter into our practice. And although I can't hear you and I miss that so much, um, we are still sharing vibration through a different uh, time and space form. So still incorporating that into our practice. Inhale in through the nose. And exhale, H-A, out of the mouth. Inhale in through the nose. And exhale, H-A, release out of the mouth. Relax the shoulder down. Maybe let some tension go with that. This time, inhale, prepare for OM. Inhale, breathe in and release the breath. And we are going to start today with butterfly legs. So creating a diamond shape with your legs. And we're gonna work into a hold. So getting yourself set up, you may even want to uh, support the knees, put blocks under the knees. In this stretch, we really want to leave some distance in between the pelvis and your heels. So leaving a generous distance, you can kind of pick up the glutes, move them out of the way, sit on a hook or something, again, to help the pelvic bowl tilt down. And you can experiment with width. I find like a, narrow, a narrower width helps my pelvic bowl tilt down a little better. Um, maybe two books like this would be like ideal for me. And then maybe grabbing a pillow to support the chest and folding forward, letting the head hang. I'm actually going to grab the pillow. And we will be here for five, six minutes. And during this time, I'm going to also break down, break down yin. And I think I'm not sure if everybody here has um, practiced yin before, so I'm gonna go through everything. I think you have though. And yin, in terms of energetic qualities, it's the opposite of yang. And if you think of yang energy, it is motion, it's activity, it's solar, it's bright. And neither of these energies can exist without the other. They're very dependent on each other for, um, for, for them to exist. And yin is going to be then dark, and it's going to be slow, and it's going to be mystery and rest. It's going to be relying a little bit more on your intuition. Like if you were moving around outside at nighttime, you may have to rely on your intuition, and your other senses are not as strong then as they would be during the day. And in terms of anatomy and physiology, Yin stresses and compresses the connective tissue, the ligaments, the bones, and the joints, and the fascia. And the best way I ever heard fascia explained, besides like watching um, videos of cadavers, um, which is actually fascinating if you ever look it up, but fascia is, if you like peeled open an orange, it's that fuzzy layer underneath, that white fuzzy layer. And it is also the casing that is holding the pulp and the orange or the tangerine or whatever it is together. And you can't stretch fascia. Um, in fact, it's not recommended. And that's why we're stressing and compressing and we're doing these long holds. It's also helping the bones regenerate 
through this compression and it's preventing the shrink wrapping of the muscles. So it's another approach to health. And for me, I feel like I'm always doing my future self like such a solid. It's also a really good compliment if you're walking a lot or running a lot or just any, any movement, it's, it's going to be a good compliment to sitting. Um, love the in. So there are three truths, there are three tenets, three pillars to the practice. And the first is to find your gentle edge, which we already kind of talked through at the beginning of class. And this is also referred to sometimes, um, Alyssa calls this pertinent depth. And I, I like that definition because it's your, it's personalized. It's for you to discern where that depth is going to be. And it's anywhere between like 40 and 70%. My range of motion may be able like to have myself totally flopped forward, but like can I hold that for five, six minutes? Like I definitely cannot. So that is where I'm going to look to props like pillows and blankets for support. Or if you did a fold, you wouldn't usually put blocks under your knees, like in a more fluid class, you might in a yin class because you want to be able to sustain the pose for time. Um, and that brings us to our second tatva or the second truth of this practice, which is to be still. And stillness, Honestly, I think stillness can be really challenging. I think that if you've had a really long-winded, exhausting day, it can be just fabulous to surrender and to oppose. But sometimes you're greeted with a lot of noise from the mind when your body finally stops running and going and doing. And if that is the case, breath is such a fabulous tool and also body scans and then redirecting your attention to the breath or maybe noticing the breath in relation to the muscles that Veronica talked about at the beginning of class and trying to integrate that knowledge into your embodiment practice, how you are showing up and how you want to show up in your body. And there are two reasons in which you would move. Uh, the first is if you're invited to go deeper. Sometimes the muscles after a couple minutes, they like, they do become passive. They really relax and you're able to go deeper into the stretch. A another reason you'd want to move as if you're experiencing pain. This is uh, not a class where you want to persevere through the pain. So adding pillows, blocks, bolsters, yoga mats, couch cushions, like really getting creative, especially with the home practice or pulling back the edge or trying to meet the intention of the pose in, a, in another way. And if you have questions on that after class, um, please stick around and ask. Uh, you can also shoot a question in the chat box, but I feel like sometimes it's easier to talk about things. So please like stick around and ask in class. And then the third thing is time. And I keep track of time and as does Veronica on our phones, we give a halfway mark and a final minute. And this is just so you can more easily surrender into the pose. You don't have to worry about anything. And that final minute for me just makes me feel really grounded. I'm like, okay, I've got 60 seconds. So hopefully if you can utilize that as a tool also and in this practice with like reflection and, you know, yielding this more regenerative practice, also cultivating the qualities of compassion and kindness and curiosity. And I feel like we've come to a point in our culture where those words, even like mindfulness, they actually like may evoke like almost an eye rolling response in a lot of people because they've been overused and maybe kind of like sold to us. And so I've been liking lately to boil, boil those words down to their essence and what that means to you, like authentically showing up and holding yourself, creating that space for yourself in each of the poses, using them as a little meditation practice. And we are reaching the end of our fold here. Um, when we do come up and out of the pose, Please move slowly, um, move with intention. And it can even be kind of a fun practice before you move to decide how you're gonna move, like what is gonna be the most interesting exit strategy and noticing like what you're gravitating towards and like maybe even trying something different. That's just kind of like an experiment. Maybe you don't really wanna do it, but it can be an interesting um, way to kind of reflect with the neural pathways that are built into our habitual movements. And gently, vertebrae by vertebrae, 
on curl the spine. Lift the head, neck, and chest. And after a long hold like that, you may be craving a movement. Do that movement. Um, I personally am gonna close my legs like I would close a book. And I want to windshield wiper my legs right to left, left to right. You may be craving something else. So really, your body is always gonna be its own best guide listening to that. And during that first hold, I do the most talking. Um, but after that, Veronica will incorporate some anatomy facts. I might add something in here and there, but mostly it's a practice of silence because we're leaning into this, the yin qualities of this practice. All right. And coming in to a uh, tabletop, stacking shoulders over wrists, hips over knees. And maybe you want to flow through a quick cat cow. And we're going to work our way into cow face pose, gomukhasana. And to get there, we'll start first by bringing the left leg, which I'm not sure what you can see. I'm going to lift up my left hand so you can see my left leg's lifting. And then it's going behind the right thigh. Create some distance in between your shins. And then let the hips kind of fall back. And that may not have been an effective way for you to get in. So I think now you can kind of see my legs. The right leg is over the left leg. And you may get here. And if you're experiencing pain or like too much sensation in your knee, extend the left leg out long. You're still going to get all the same benefits of this pose. And you may even tap into like your hamstring. So maybe you want to do that. But we're going to set up shoelace legs. And if you're experiencing any pain in the top knee, take a block or I actually like a pillow in between the knees is kind of nice. So getting yourself set up and then um, I am going to use a scarf as a strap to set up for Gomukhasana. We're actually going to do Gomukhasana and you can use like a sock, you can use like a beanie, a blanket, a t-shirt, like it does not have to be a scarf or a strap. And getting yourself situated, and then putting the scarf or the strap in your right hand, lifting the right arm up, swooping the left arm behind you, and arriving in cow face pose. And this may feel like a lot in the shoulders. Um, I feel like this is totally like after hearing Veronica talk about those muscles, I'm like kind of fixating on the sensations going on in my torso, both on the front and the back half. And you can stay up like this, or if you would like, you can choose to fold forward, which is, I think, the experience that I'm going to go for. And I need to make sure I set up the semi-timer. And if there's any point where this becomes too much, holding in the strap or scarf, of course, you can release the arms down. You can also choose to kind of like embrace yourself, kind of like that kid that used to like make out middle school with themselves, you know? <laughs> um, I always think of that when I grasp myself. It's very, very mature of me. Um, but that's another option you can do with the arms or you can do like eagle arms if you're not feeling the, the golden kasana. But this really does get into text. And noticing if there's anywhere you're holding tension. I just found a lot of tension in my jaw, so I'm clenching the jaw. 
And then noticing if that tension also carried into the neck, trying to relax the muscles in the neck. Relaxing the shoulders as much as you can, relaxing the belly, and clenching the toes, relaxing the glutes. And this is the halfway mark. And if the fold becomes too much, you can elevate the chest again. You don't have to be folding right now. You can kind of focus more on the tall spine and the sensation going on in the shoulders. So we're both, we're accessing both the hips and the shoulders, both on socket joints. And this is the final minute. Okay, and then releasing the strap down, taking any shakes or shimmies the body is craving after a long hold like that, especially in the shoulders. And we'll transition to the other side. You can get there any way you see fits. I like to do the transition where you put your hands, both hands on the left side, plant the feet into the ground, but keep your feet where they are and then twist around all the way around, face the back, go left, come all the way around, and then end up this time with your left leg on top of the right leg. And on this side, it may feel totally different. You may need to extend the right leg out on this side. Um, you may be looking for support on this side in between the legs, um, sometimes from side to side. I know on my left side, my leg usually goes up a bit higher. So there may be a difference from side to side, and that is, absolutely a part of this practice. It's totally normal with anatomy to be a little different. Sometimes in life you have to compensate in one way or another um, to adjust to a circumstance and that pattern is still in the body. And we'll work our way into the arms. So this time grabbing the scarf in the left hand, bringing the left arm up and then swooping the right arm behind you this time. And this also may feel totally different. I know that the distance in between my hands on the left side is more generous than it is on the right. And that is totally normal. Maybe you wanted to go for the embrace or the eagle arms if that's preferable, preferable to you, but trying on the Gumukasana arms. If it seems like something that sparks investigation in your practice, an option to stay elevated in the spine or option to fold forward slowly. And maybe as you move down, you realize you want to support the chest with something. So you add, you add a block or a couple of blocks. 
using the props as tools to support you. Maybe the hold feels like too much. Maybe you have to come up right away and just keep the spine elevated. For me on this side, I like couldn't do the fold. And that's okay. Like there is no expectation with your range of motion, how deep into the pose. I know when I first started practicing yoga, I like thought that's what it was about. And I've learned over time that is like, <laughs> like far from the essence of yoga. And validating your edge and your truth in this moment, honoring it. This is the halfway mark. And this is the final minute. So doing a little check-in. Maybe you need to release the arms. I did. Um, we want to turn towards discomfort, but if it's feeling like too much activity in motion, like this is really a practice of surrendering, letting the arms grip go. And then gently release the arms. You're going to press the chest up, lift the torso, relax the shoulders down, and unthread the legs. Oh, I definitely felt that in my glutes. Um, so taking any counter movement the body is craving. 
um, after a fold, it can be nice actually to do this form of tabletop, kind of pressing the pelvis up. Maybe that is going to feel good to you in your body. Maybe you want a windshield wiper the legs. And Veronica is going to lead us through um, the pose with too many names. Puppy dog, melting heart, anahata, vishuddha asana. So thank you, Greta. So as she said, we're going to do melting heart. So come on hands and knees in a tabletop position. And then from here, kind of test the ground, gain some balance with the knees lined up with the hips, the shoulders stacked over the wrists. And then you kind of just walk your hands out. Walk them out to the point where you feel like you can sink your chest a little bit lower into the mat. You can either place your forehead on the mat or chin. Place a block under your forehead if that helps. If you need something under your knees, feel free to stack a blanket under your knees. We're not gonna be here long because this is a pretty intense, uh, nice extension of the spine. You get a huge side body opening. And of course, those pecs and your subscapularis muscle, they're both working right now, but we can breathe into them to relax them. This is our halfway point. Moving slowly, go ahead and walk your hands back, bringing you again to a tabletop. Let's move through just a few cat cows. Inhale and exhale, curving the spine up, tucking the tailbone under. Moving with the breath, 
creating just a little bit of warmth into this area of the spine. And then once that feels satisfying, uh, we're gonna move into our next pose on our backs. We're gonna go into supported bridge. So go ahead and lie down on your mat and grab either your blocks or a stack of pillows and blankets. If you're using blocks, I highly recommend using the flat long side so you can totally support it under your sacrum. If you need it higher, maybe add two so it's still on the flat side or stack a couple pillows over it and that'll increase the comfort as well. But you're gonna place it right at your sacrum. So that big bony triangle right at the bottom. You don't want it too far down, like on the tip of your tailbone. You also don't want it too far up where um, maybe it feels like the two points in your hips are sticking way, way up and your back is super arched. You want that sacrum to be flat. And go ahead and extend the legs. I'll start the timer. This pose can feel like a lot. It is a big, you know, movement we don't do very often. Our entire chest is revealed. Our pelvis is above our hearts. Um, but I think of it as just a nice new balancing point. Kind of allowing your body to do the thing it doesn't get to do very often. In a, in a space that's safe and with enough support. Bridge is also a really, really great stretch of the psoas. Great for any lower back or hip problems or other ball and socket joint. It gives even a nice stretch to the front of the quads. This is our halfway point.
find a minute. Taking a deep breath in to reconnect. Exhaling into whatever's feeling tense, whether it be your jaw, your lower back, maybe even send it to your ankles, which are touching the earth right now, your heels. All right, moving slowly, bring the feet up, bending the knees so they're closer to the pelvis. And then using the feet to press up and removing the block and whatever pillows you have underneath out of the way. And with this pose, I really love to do counter poses, particularly a twist. So I'll give us some time to really pull the legs over to one side, let them rest there, then bringing them back over and dropping them on the other side. It's nothing like a good twist. Then we're going to take our same block, maybe even the same formation, the block, the pillow, the blanket, and we're going to do supported fish. So for supported fish, you want to kind of have the block placed right in between the shoulder blades. Um, you don't want it to go below the rib cage. You want it to stay right there in the middle of the thoracic spine. And you also want, if your neck is feeling able, to hang your neck off the edge. This gives an opening to the front of the neck. If that is too much, feel free to put another thing under your head. Feel free to bolster this whole thing up with a pillow and just make it super comfy so your chest is just open, arms falling out to the side, legs out in front. Uh, make it real comfy. This will be here for about five minutes. And while we're in this pose and having talked about the heart um, earlier, um, I want to kind of talk about the traditional Chinese medicine that I've been using and this kind of theory around meridians and things like that. Um, and the, the heart is, its symbol is actually uh, fire because um, the, the heart is supposed to be this thing of heat. It's always pumping blood. It's constantly working. Um, and it's said to house the spirit and the spirit represents fire because it's alive and it's bright and it's also something that can dampen and not be as big or it could be sometimes too big and your spirit is too overwhelming and you need to pull it back um, and it also symbolizes this thing of warmth but also a kind of clarity and this uh, this ability to communicate um, goodness and warmth 
um, in your everyday life. So a good example my teacher said to me, would told me is um, when you see a person, an elderly person, let's say, about to cross the street carrying three bags of groceries, it's the heart spirit that makes you, that gives you that instinct, that intuition to go over and help them across the street. And it's that instinct at that moment, you know, before they cross the street, not when they're halfway down the street already, but right before they go, that instinct that tells you to help them is from the heart. We're at our halfway mark, a little bit over. So I just kind of wanted to bring this idea in of the heart representing fire, but not necessarily fire in this, you know, kind of uh, almost like, you know, big way that fire is this hot, big thing. Rather, it's this thing that we could cultivate warmth from that houses our spirit that we need to keep alive um, and that brings us joy and light. And it's said that if you have some signs and symptoms of a disharmonious heart, which isn't saying it's bad or anything, it's just saying that possibly there's something affecting your heart, it said that uh, signs and symptoms are insomnia, maybe some skipped palpations or just interesting patterned palpations of the heart, uh, and anxiety are three things that can be remedied when we tap into our heart. Final minute. All right, moving ever so slowly. Go ahead and lift yourself up. Going into a seat and I'm gonna do just a little forward fold as a counter movement. And anything that really feels good. I'm going to switch over to Greta now, who's going to take us through till the end. Awesome. Thank you. I liked that the heart is like warmth, um, like embers instead of a big flame. That's cool. Um, so moving into the hips, dang, my shoulders very much felt that. Um, Moving into half pigeon and also deer and stag. And bring the feet uh, hips width distance here, maybe even a little bit wider. And you can let the legs fall right to left, left to right. And just noticing um, the legs moving, the femur moving in the ball and socket joint. The articular cartilage is what allows for that gliding sensation. And then the next time the legs fall to the right, let them go all the way to the right. And for me, I actually have to scoot my hips back here to create the space. And we wanna create 90 degrees. We're moving into deer pose or stag pose. 
We want to create 90 degree angles with our legs. And it may not be a perfect 90 degrees. This one may be more like, I don't know, 90 and then 78. You want to feel grounded onto the glutes. And then inhale to find length in your spine. And exhale, twist towards the right. And from here, and slowly begin to lower. I don't want to lose my voice. I'm going to change the position of my toes. Slowly begin to lower onto the floor. And you may get here and realize you want some support for your chest. You may also get here and realize that you are actually craving, like holding over your shin. And so you can kind of experiment with the degrees that you are holding. And we're going to do half pigeon, so keeping that, that in mind, we are doing um, a lot of hip work right now. So kind of finding the pertinent depth, finding your edge, and I'm going to go ahead and set our timer. If you do decide to go kind of twist all the way back, it's a nice uh, side body stretch. I'm kind of craving that today, but it really might just be what your body is is asking for. And um, I was going to speak to you just really quickly. Um, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't. The ball and socket joints, they are actual like containers. Like it's like a bowl and then you can imagine like a tennis ball with like a stick out of it, like rolling around, like that is what's going on. And it's a container like it's literally shaped like something that would hold water or hold something in it like a like a salad or soup and i often i have found like often when people are anxious like their shoulders are up there's a lot of tension there and we sometimes can store anxiety in our bodies in our shoulders and often we can share um hold experiences and hold them in our hips as well. And it may not be something that you're initially sensitive to, but when you give yourself silence and space and time, you may feel a physical sensation arise. You also might feel an energetic sensation arise. And it may be like a memory. It may be like an overwhelming like emotion. If something like that does come up, like that happen sometimes in this practice and I want to just like let you know that like it's happened to me before like it's happened to a lot of people that do this kind of practice and for one like you're ready to turn towards it if it is coming up but giving it space if like something does come up you don't have to get stuck there and kind of like taking a few steps back and to borrow from the words of La Mirada Owens like letting it float so kind of giving it spaciousness and knowing that it doesn't have to drive the car, it doesn't have to dominate the experience, especially like the hips. I feel like the hips are where we sometimes store the material in our minds. Like just like it's compartmentalized, pushed away, and that's where sometimes it'll come up then while we're working into the hips. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that because it's, very much a part of energetic experience sometimes. And we are actually uh, 30 seconds past the, past the halfway mark in the twist here. This is the final minute.
And slowly begin to walk the hands back towards your pelvis, elevate the chest, unswivel the neck, unswivel your torso, and keep the right shin forward and extend the left leg behind you, coming into half pigeon. So we're gonna do the right side and then we'll mosey on our way to the left side. If you get here and this is too much in the knee or the ankle, hope over onto your back to practice uh, pigeon four, Pigeon four, wow, um, figure four. And for half pigeon, you can put a book or something underneath your glutes so you feel supported and stable in your pelvis. And then slowly begin to fold forward. You may not wanna block, maybe that's something that's not helpful for you. I've been using this book. It's kind of like the right height for me. And slowly, bringing the chest down. And you may even wanna support the chest on like a pillow or a block, or you may just wanna stay lifted. Maybe the, the forward fold motion is, is too much today. I'm gonna kinda of scooch myself back here. And once you get down there, uh, if you find yourself craving a little something extra, option today to, with the left hand, thread it in between the right arm and the mat, kind of going for a thread the needle. So bringing the left hand between that window, bringing the left cheek to the mat. redirecting my body to be in like a better frame. And not worrying about what's going on externally. I just want to make sure you can see what we were doing. And if you try to twist and you're not feeling it, it can always come out. And they will give a halfway mark if you want to alternate your cheeks. And this is the halfway mark. And the final minute.
And then slowly begin to press the palms into the mat. Walk the hands back towards your pelvis. Tuck under the back toe. Engage your back leg and send the right leg up for a three-legged dog. Oh yeah. Big scorpion flip. Any counter movement the body is craving. I definitely want to rotate clockwise and counterclockwise with my leg. And just noticing the range of motion in the hip socket on the right side, especially after a long stretch like that. Go ahead and come down into a table. Let the hips sink off towards one side and then bring the feet again uh, about hips width distance or a little bit wider. You may want to scoot the glutes back, create some space, and then windshield wipering the legs. Again, right to left, left to right. And then the next time the legs fall onto the left side, let them land. And maybe you manually want to maneuver the feet with your hands, getting situated on the glutes, getting the ankles set up with your legs. And then inhale to find length in your spine. And exhale, twist towards the left. And you may want to stay there, or you may choose to fold forward. Once you start folding, you may want to grab some support for the chest. I forgot to grab my pillows before class, and I'm regretting it. Um, so maybe using a support under the pillow I will give a halfway mark. I sometimes really don't like putting my face down. So if you want to flip cheeks, I will give, of course, that halfway mark. And like I said on the other side, like maybe today you want to fold over your shin. Like maybe that's where it's interesting or maybe over your knee. Like you always, I always encourage uh, kind of like investigative awareness. Like where is it going to suit you the most? And this is the halfway mark. And if the mind is kind of returning to its habitual thought patterns, fantasizing or planning, whatever it is that you're thinking about, really trying to melt into the floor, maybe directing your attention to the earth, knowing the earth is always holding you, feeling your foundation, and connecting with that stability of being on the ground. And this is the final minute.
and slowly begin to press the palms into your mat, walk the hands back towards your pelvis, and then keep the left shin as it is, and go ahead and make your way into half pigeon on the other side. Left shin forward, right leg is behind you. This side may feel totally different. You may want support under the left glute to help level the hips. It feels like a lot in the knee or a lot in the ankle. Of course, you can come to laying on your back and take figure four, interweaving the fingers on top of the shin or below the thigh or even re relaxing the foot down. So there's many, many good ways to access the intention of getting into the hip. And on this side, if you would like to add on the extra layer of threading the needle, so bringing, let's see, this time the left hand in between that window you created and bringing the left cheek to the mat. I'm sorry, I just said the wrong thing. Um, Starting the needle, bringing the right hand in between the window you've created with the floor and your arm. I keep rotating around to face the right direction and I'm getting confused directionally. Right cheek to the mat, starting the needle with the right arm. And if that layer is too much, of course, coming out. This is the halfway mark. And final minute. And slowly begin to walk the hands back towards your pelvis, tuck under the back toe, engage the back leg, and send the left leg up high. Ooh, and there may be a sigh or a release or a moan that accompanies that sensation. Really enjoying the sensation of the release. 
Roll the ankle. Roll the femur around the thigh. All the muscles running through there, the adductors, glutes, quads. Okay, and then come down to a seat and come into final rest, Shavasana, laying on the back. If you would prefer to take Shavasana in like a fetal position or on your belly, you're always welcome to take final rest in the form that is going to suit your needs the most. And taking a moment to relax your limbs, relax the joints, relax the neck, and connect to the earth, connect to the ground. Feel the weight of your body collaborating with the force of gravity. And I'll let you know when it's time to come up and out of the practice. And slowly begin to invite movement back into your body. If you would like to practice a longer Shavasana, of course, you're welcome to stay. But if you would like to be guided out, kind of inviting sensation back into your body, it can be kind of wiggling and scrunching of your face. Maybe it's bouncing of the shoulders, bouncing of the legs. Bring the arms above you, stretching. Hug the knees in towards your chest and choose if you want to roll over onto the right or the left side. Left being associated with yin and all these qualities of yin, yielding and deep listening, right being the qualities associated with yang. And I like to give a choice because I don't think it's, I don't want to be prescriptive into the qualities that you want to invite in energetically. It is the end of night, so the left might make more sense using the bicep as a pillow in a fetal position, honoring where you are in your process, giving yourself credit for showing up and doing this deeply unique work. Um, I think it takes a lot of bravery and courageousness to show up and kind of peel back the layers, uh, not only of the connective tissue and the fascia, but also 
uh, layers of self and gently begin to press yourself up to a seat. And if it feels um, authentic to you, we'll meet with hands at heart center in the Anjali Mudra. And this gesture it represents non-dualism. And from here, honoring the lineage of this practice, honoring its roots in India and the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, all the texts, the wisdom texts and teachers that came before in this long line of yoga, but also like we're pulling from Chinese medicine and meridian theory. So thank you, Veronica, for peppering that in because this is called yin. So integrating of those two lineages and just like the yin and the yang symbol, yin and the yang symbol coming together and touching that heart center. And from there, bringing hands from heart center to third eye, strengthening the connection between your heart and your mind. And bowing forward to seal in practice. Honoring all layers of self, both the luminous and the dark qualities. And today, just now, I also want to, um, I also, we, we do a land acknowledgement in this class. And so honoring the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people, the Duwamish people, the Rockaway and Canarsie, um, Veronica's in Brooklyn, I'm here in Seattle. And it's unceded land because it was, it was taken and it, we are occupying that territory. Um, so always honoring that land and those traditions and the people that carry those traditions forward and the other lands. Um, I know we've got friends in Texas here and yes, thank you so much for being here. Um, please stick around if you have any questions and otherwise, I don't know, feel free to unmute.